This is the Brain Chip Podcast. Hear from our thought leaders about neuromorphic computing, beneficial AI, and how Brain Chip's Akita is pushing AI to the edge. This podcast is a place for investors, practitioners, and anyone interested in the future of AI. Hello, everybody. My name is Sean Harrop, Chief Executive Officer here at BrainShip. And today, I have a very special guest, Jeffrey Moore. Jeffrey is a prolific speaker, author, and advisor who splits his time between cutting-edge startups in Silicon Valley and some of the most established names in high tech, such as Salesforce, Microsoft, and Google. Jeffrey's entire work has been focused on market dynamics surrounding disruptive technologies. His first book, Crossing the Chasm, focuses on the challenge of startup companies transitioning from early adopting phase to mainstream customers. His most recent book, Zone to Win, addresses it from the other angle, how large enterprises do when they're embracing such disruptive innovations. I couldn't think of a better guest to discuss brainship than Jeffrey. A little bit on the personal front, Jeffrey and I share our Irish roots, and we both share a passion for golf. Welcome to the podcast, Jeffrey. Well, thank you, sir. And tee it up. <laughs> tee it up. I like that. Let's go. So let's go ahead and start with, you know, your most your first book and the one that most people identify with you, which is Crossing the Chasm. And you think about what brain chip is and where we are. You know, we're, we're in a category. We're a leader in the category. But it's early days for Edge AI. Talk about what lessons we can learn from that. Well, so what, what the technology adoption lifecycle has taught us over the years is that there's these four stages in the evolution of any category. And I would say that brain chip and neuromorphic uh, uh, computing is in stage one, which is, we call it the early market. It's, 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 it's characterized by technology enthusiasts and visionaries. You focus on the disruptive capabilities of the technology, and you're looking for early adopters who are willing to say, I want to, I want to be first. And I'm willing to do the extra effort to go first, and I can bring the resources necessary to make that work. And so it's characterized by projects, and in particular, what you're looking for are big impact flagship projects that capture everybody's attention. The rest, the, the, the mainstream market is, is, is still saying, sounds good. I'm not an expert. I need to see other people doing it before I do it. So that's what creates what we call the chasm. And crossing the chasm begins when you find that first use case that pragmatic people will say, well, we can't solve this use case with our conventional solutions. Maybe we should try the, 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 the brain chip solution because we need, we need to make progress and we're not making any progress. And so that, that commitment to that first use case and really nailing that first use case is the crossing the chasm play. Great, great. And I think that's a perfect lesson for us to go um, and talk about a little bit later on. Um, let me go ahead with another second question. I'm going to jump around a little bit today. Um, you know, you you talk to some of the biggest companies in the world and some of the most innovative startups. You know, what we do here, we produce IP for companies that are going to build custom chips with AI functionality. My experience when I talk to the various customers we're talking to and prospects world-class companies are going very vertical down to the silicon level in certain industries more so than others um can you comment on that do you share that same experience about vertical efforts yeah i think this is again i think these are leading edge companies in their industry so it's te tesla obviously been a great example in, in, in automotive but now of course tesla has put every other automotive company on record to say look you have to you have to now catch up to us and so i think you, you see that you see that with uh, the data center people in energy management and they're they're doing some things with uh early with machine learning and, and and artificial intelligence and and you're seeing you know companies like the the hyperscalers who want to design their own chips facebook's wants to design their own chips amazon wants to design their own chips and and so it's a it's and, and the folks at synopsis who sold more traditional ip they're seeing this too, which is like we're seeing, it used to be you could only sell to the merchant silicon people. Now that there's a next generation industrial designer who's saying, no, I want to I want to take my design all the way down to the silicon. It's a new, it's a relatively new phenomenon. I would say it's only leading edge companies that are really doing much with it, but it's clearly the, the, a trend for the future. It's a harbinger of the future. Oh, I love your, I loved your comments there. And I love it particularly with Tesla because 
we have a lot of interest um, in the auto industry because Tesla has created this push. And we, as you and I were talking, you know, Mercedes put out there just recently, you know, they're going to build chips. You know, they've announced, I believe, three chips that they're building currently and creating an operating system. That's true verticalization. You know, and another one that we've been talking to a different class of company, a company in, in communication, something you wouldn't even think about. And it's not a handset, but they want AI functionality in their devices and they're going to build chips. So world class companies are usually driven by some competitive nature. Somebody's got to lead second and third place, or they want to maintain their first place. It's that competitive nature that's really driving that verticalization. Yeah. And I, I think there is, I think you said something important there, which is there's really, there's two, there's a, a disruptor and there's a disruptee. So the disruptor is the genuine first mover. It is Elon Musk. It is, Net, you know, Reed Hastings at Netflix. You know, it is Mark Benioff with SaaS back in the day with, with Salesforce. But then Everybody else now has become a disruptee. And what's clear with the chips is, look, when we used to use chips in the past, they were for automating things that, that were not particularly differentiating. We were just trying to take cost and time out of the equation. But now you're saying, no, I, if I want to create my own chip, this is a company who's saying, no, I want to differentiate at that level of technology. So I don't want to use a merchant product because anybody else could use the same product. I, I need to have something that puts my own stamp on it. That that's uh, going that far down to the chip level. That's relatively new, but that's increasingly, and particularly as we were talking in our conversation about edge computing. At edge, it's hard to imagine doing edge computing without doing something like that. That's right. Well, let's let's go with that. Let's talk a little bit further because. That's absolutely right. And, and you and I were talking a few moments ago about this, and I was showing you some data. You know, a lot of analysts are predicting, of course, the move towards the edge. And I, and I agree with that, obviously, with the, what we provide to the market and our products. But, you know, most, you know, you and I have been in the Valley for a long time. And um, most of these models go very centralized and decentralized and back and forth. You know, and you talk about all the buzz in AI and all the, most of these are very centralized data center applications. Well, we can't keep always doing that. There's always the right level of compute near the devices at some point that will prevail. I think we're right on that edge. Do you share that same view that some of those workloads will go to the edge? Oh, yeah, they, they have to. Well, I mean, basically, what's really interesting about this latest generation of technology is when we were, when you and I, <laughs> you and I go back a ways, but when, when computing was first on our radar, it was about taking cost out of, out of, the, out of the thing. Now we're trying to take time out of the equation. We're trying to, to, to reduce cycle time to literally to milliseconds and, and nanoseconds or whatever. Well, you can't do that if you're going to ship, if you're going to make a, a conversation between the edge and the core, the, 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 just the amount of transition time is way too much. So you have to do it at the edge. And, and furthermore, there's stuff that happens at the edge that frankly is so unique to the edge. You don't want to send it to some general purpose solution. You want it to get solved there. And so uh, I'm actually, I, I'll give you an analogy that's kind of weird, but I've been reading a bunch of biology and there, in, in your cells, every cell in your body, there's something called mitochondria. And mitochondria is what makes all the energy uh, ATP in your, in your cell, but it has its own DNA. In other words, your cell has DNA, but my, mitochondria has its own DNA because it doesn't want to go back to corporate to get permission <laughs> to build the next, uh, you know, the next piece of energy. And I think edge computing is a little bit like that. That's great. That's great. That's great. Well, I'm going to ask a little slightly different question. Obviously, you keep a real good pulse on what's going on in the Valley and other places. It, it, you can't ignore the productivity gains that AI is bringing to the market. Share some of the lessons and conversations you're having in the C-suite as you go around the world. Are you hearing a lot about AI and what it can do to transform some of your clients' work? Well, it's really interesting. You know, I think the conversation's been changing rapidly. So so two years ago, you'd say, well, we're talking about machine learning and AI, and you'd, you'd talk about Google, or you'd talk about, you know, uh, one, two or three of these thought leaders. But mo most recently, this chat GPT, generative AI, has captured everybody's imagination because it's the first thing that they can actually play with. And so what that's doing is it's making people realize They've underestimated what this thing really can be. I mean, they they heard about it, but they just couldn't quite grok it. Well, now people are grokking it. And so, you know, you, your technology isn't chat GPT. I mean, that's not what it's for. But I think chat GPT is going to change the adoption readiness for your customer base as well. Because people are going to go, look, 
we should be using this thing for everything. That's right. And I think you're absolutely right. The awareness of, of that offering has created has created a lot of interest in saying, where can we apply AI technologies in a lot of ways? So I think it's wonderful for all of us. Well, look, let's come back a little closer to your work, you know, in your most recent book, Zone to Win, which I love the I love the write up that says addresses the challenge of large enterprises when they face embracing disruptive innovation, when it's clearly in their best interest to do so, but they struggle to do it. Talk about that and how that could apply to us as well. Well, and this is, by the way, these are your customers. The, these, these are, I mean, you, the people that are going to buy brain chip, chips to build their own chips are the are the, you know, the the Mercedes of this world or the Disney's or the or the Tesla, whoever it is. Well, those companies have established business models and budgets that are designed to run the traditional operating model, and they have processes and procedures and stuff that are designed to support running at scale under relatively conventional rules. Disruptive innovation just messes with all of that stuff. I mean, it, it doesn't obey processes. It doesn't. It doesn't have the same ROI. It loses money in the short term. And so, how in the world can you manage that inside a corporation that's tuned to you know be, have profitable quarter, quarter after quarter after quarter? And so, what the zone model said is, and the, the zone model, by the way, was developed with Satya Nadella and his team at Microsoft, and Mark Benioff and his team at Salesforce. So, really, world world class works, right? And the, the model says, look, you need a performance zone for your traditional business, the core business. You need a productivity zone to do all the supporting processes. And those two zones are 90% or more of your budget. And that's conventional. That's steady as she goes. But you need an incubation zone, which is where you do the stuff that's off, that's really off, off the, the reservation as far as those two other two zones are concerned. And what people were doing is they, they knew that. I mean, that wasn't a new idea, but they didn't know how to manage it. And they still, I would argue, struggle with managing it. And the inside of the book was use the venture capital operating model. Don't use their financial model. Don't try to be a venture capitalist, but use the startup operating model, fund to milestones, hold people accountable to market outcomes, you know, and, 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 and insist that they, they make these, these, these incremental progresses. And, and and don't keep funding something and don't ever fund anything annually, fund it to the next step. Those ideas, so that's all around the incubation zone. And then there's a fourth zone called the transformation zone, which is when do you go big or go home? And and with, with incubation, sometimes you go home, right? You, you, you don't do everything. But, what, but when you have to go big, the stories that were all being written are all about the, the, the disruptors. Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and those, God bless them. But most of us are not disruptors. Most of us are disruptees. And so the question is, how do you get your conventional organization to transform under the pressure of a Tesla, under the pressure of a Netflix, et cetera? And there's a whole sort of narrative and logic around how you have to do that. And if you don't do it, there were 55 companies in the first chapter that don't exist anymore that were rock star companies in their day because they couldn't do the transformation and they didn't get to play after that. Yeah, great learnings. So let, let me ask you one last question to bring this home because it's kind of a follow-up to that. My belief and my experience, and I'm sure you probably the same because again, we've been in the Valley for a long time, is these kind of technologies come out with many um, participants in it. But over time, they always kind of narrow down to a de facto standard, two or two or three major players, you know, which is kind of the natural state of a lot of things. And I think AI generally is like right now, there's a lot of disruptive technologies. And, you know, I, I see the day not too far, you know, measured in years, not decades, where a couple will emerge out as de facto standards. Our goal is to be one of those de facto standards on the edge. Do you share that belief about de facto standards and how they emerge? Sure, because the way the mainstream customer base makes buying decisions is they want to buy, first of all, when their peers are buying. So they 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 wait until you know they kind of see systems in production and they say, okay, it's safe to go in the water, et cetera. And then they want to buy the market leader, not because the market leader necessarily has the best product but because the market leader is going to set the de facto standards. So when you and I, when you were at HP and it was it was Oracle versus Sybase, for example, you could argue that Sybase in some ways was a better database, 
But Oracle set the de facto standard, and then all of the independent software vendors went with Oracle, and then the in systems integrators went with Oracle. And so if you're a pragmatic person, you're going, well, I'm going to go with Oracle, because that's where everybody went. That happens in every, that, that's, that's why Intel was the chip leader. It's why Microsoft was the, the operating system leader. It's why Cisco was the networking leader. You know, you people want to do that. And so it's very, very important. And, and you, there's a point in the market where you either are going to be that one, or you need to team up with somebody to, who, who is going to be that one, because at some point, it's just no fun to be, you know, a second class citizen in a first class market. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that is why here at BrainChip, we're so highly focused on our innovation cycle and in the speed of innovation, because it's moving so quickly. And that's why we're pushing it so hard at this point. Jeffrey, I can't thank you enough. A great conversation. I, I think we could talk for hours. You know, I love I love your experience, love your insights. So thank you so much for today. Well, my pleasure. Thanks, Sean. And I hope to see you on the golf course soon. I, I, next round on me. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Brain Chip Podcast. Please remember to rate and review on your favorite podcast platform.